Well, good morning, church, and happy Easter. Much like that first Easter Sunday, we find ourselves today scattered about, and there is sorrow and fear even in the air. But unlike that first Easter, we awoke today with joy because we know what has happened. And thus we can join together wherever we are and say, He is risen. He is risen indeed. And our hearts can sing. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Well, I am Chaplain Jason Gregory, the Assistant Command Chaplain, and I'm coming to you from my home. Yes, I actually do have a church window uh, in my home, and I'll soon be joined by Chaplain John Logan from the chapel, who will be preaching God's Word this morning, as well as Monty Maxwell and Bill Myers, who will lead us in the worship of Almighty God. Hear now our call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Our opening worship hymn today is number 367 in the gray celebration hymnal. Yes, you can find the same gray hymnal we use in the chapel online. I'll let you pause it now, even if you want to go get that. Number 367, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Well, amen. May I ask if you would join with me in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you today through the rent veil. That way of access into your presence opened, us, opened up to us by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And thus we come this morning mindful that we are sinners in your sight, asking you to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all the things that we have done, the things that we have left undone that are contrary to your will. And yet we rejoice that it is finished. Sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning because of Jesus Christ, a man of sorrows and who is acquainted with grief, and it is by his stripes that we are healed. Darkness has been swallowed up by light, and death has been vanquished by abundant life. So we come this morning through the merits and the intercession of the Prince of Peace, our great High Priest, asking that you would draw near to us as we seek to draw near to you. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, I'd ask you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. We'll be looking at the first eight verses in the Gospel according to Matthew. Hear now God's word. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The sky shall unfold, preparing his entrance. The stars shall applaud him with thunders of praise. The sweet look in his eyes shall enhance the Angel. 
angels shall sound the shout of his coming the sleeping will rise from from the slumbering place and those who remain shall shall be changed in a moment and we shall be Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, not only be acceptable in thy sight, speak to our hearts and minds to receive thee, to listen to thee, to hearken to thy voice. These things we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Today is Resurrection Sunday, also known to many as Easter, and this is the Today, we commemorate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gained victory over death and the grave. I want you to think back for a moment. On that resurrection morning, the disciples were in a period of mourning. They had just witnessed their Savior, the proclaimed Messiah, brutally crucified. And when Jesus died on the cross, he was taken down given to Joseph of Arimathea, who had earlier asked Pontius Pilate for the body to inter Jesus into his tomb. So I imagine Joseph and the disciples wrapped Jesus up in burial shroud and sealed the tomb shut with a large stone. And when someone is beloved and laid to rest in their place of internment, it is common for family and friends to stay a while at the gravesite. They stay to bid their last goodbyes, to cry a little bit. There's a lot of tears and sniffles. And when Jesus was interred in the tomb, I imagine the disciples stayed around to grieve, to comfort each other, and contemplate the memories of and the flashbacks of the miracles and teachings. I'm sure they reminisced on the three years of his ministry with them. It may have raced through their minds. And as the tears may have streamed down their cheeks, now they have to run and hide because being associated with Jesus could probably mean something similar to them. When a leader of a movement is killed or assassinated, 
the course of history is altered, and the age-old question, why, is asked. The disciples, while in their moment of grief, had forgotten that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. Jesus was Judea's greatest hope for political and social change. The disciples saw themselves on the bandwagon for ushering the kingdom on earth. And they were anticipating being in the political limelight. Jesus told Pilate in John chapter 18, verses 36, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would have fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Even the disciples didn't get it. They didn't understand. But now they are in a state of confusion. What do we do now? And as the disciples contemplated what to do next and feared for their lives, it is said that two women named Mary decided to go back and visit the gravesite. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 8 tells us that now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly, tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' words. End of quote. I could only imagine how these two women felt when they arrived at the tomb only to find that the tomb was not only empty, but a heavenly being talks to them and gives them the good news. He whom they seek is not dead but alive. Now I could imagine I would have probably been like them too. They, they, they ran with fear and joy and excitement all rolled up into one. Their mourning turned into dancing. Last week, Saturday, April 4th, commemorated the 52nd anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a champion for civil, civil rights, nonviolence, he challenged the status quo, spoke truth to power, and during a time in our nation's history when there was not only social injustice, but also social instability. He was assassinated April 4th in 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. And the night before his assassination, on April 3rd, Dr. King preached at the Mason Church in Memphis. He preached what is known as his famous I've been to the mountaintop sermon, which still resonates to this day. Civil rights leader and House Representative John Lewis said, on August 4th, 1968, during that turbulent time, something died in America. He said, something died in all of us. When the lives of great leaders for social change are tragically cut short, the movements and visions they championed are eventually materialized. And they're materialized by those who believed in their cause. And those slain, we see their dreams lived out as we work and fight together as Americans. Today, you can visit the tomb of these stalwart visionaries. I've had the opportunity to visit some of these famous grave sites of leaders and people who left a legacy and mark on history. The tombs of John F. Kennedy, Rod F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Alexander Hamilton, and many, many others. Here at our Naval Academy Chapel, we have the the Academy graveside that has all the 
corpses of famous individuals in the Navy who left their mark in society. And here at the Academy Chapel, below me, is the crypt of John Paul Jones, the father of our Navy. There is a solemnity that comes with visiting the grave sites of those who left the mark on history. But for the ones who were martyred, sometimes I question, had these individuals been, had not been killed, had they been alive during their time, what would the current condition of their time and even our time have been had they not been cut short by an assassin's bullet? My brothers and sisters, the remains of these historical figures rests in their crypts and tombs. However, in Jerusalem, there is an empty tomb. I want to say it again. In Jerusalem, there is an empty tomb where our Lord and Savior once laid dead for a brief moment. I've had the opportunity to visit the tomb of Jesus, and as I stepped inside of that tomb where Jesus once laid, the words, come see the place where the Lord lay stuck to me or struck me like a thunderbolt. You have to one day see that place where once our Lord laid because it's empty. Jesus rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and a movement was established like no other. In an article titled The Significance of the Resurrection of Christ by Uche Ikpa, who's also an ordained minister and TV producer, she said the greatest event in human life is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives credence, authenticity, and reality to the Christian faith. It proves salvation is real for millions and millions of believers down throughout the ages, all over the world, regardless of color, creed, or profession. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 to 15, he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. There are three things that Jesus' empty tomb signifies. Three things that the empty tomb points to. Number one, the empty tomb signifies hope. The resurrection gives us hope that though death is a part of life, death is not the end. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in these words found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13, he said, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died, rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Very encouraging words from the Apostle Paul. And as the Apostle Paul quoted these words, these are the words that are very strong, that point to our faith. Another thing we need to contemplate is that, number two, the empty tomb signifies power. It signifies power to do the impossible. Number one was hope. Number two is power. It signifies power. Mark chapter 9, verses 23 tells us, Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. In John chapter 11, verse 25, after Lazarus was dead and laying in the tomb for four days, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And on the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Philippians chapter 4, verses 13 tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And number three, lastly, 
the empty tomb signifies and points us to salvation. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 tells us, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And as I'm wrapping up here, Jesus was condemned and crucified during Passover. What we call Holy Week was Passover. Passover celebrates the deliverance of the Israelites from the bondage of slavery and the exit out of Egypt. It is also known as the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Unleavened Bread. God commanded Moses to observe that feast for a week so that the Israelites would remember it for generations to come and that it was God who delivered the Israelites from bondage. Jesus endured the cross on Passover, and while Passover signifies the deliverance of the Egyptians out of Egypt, Jesus died on the cross during Passover to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Moses and Jesus represent deliverance. The book of Exodus tells us also that Pharaoh had hardened his heart. I want to point you to Pharaoh and the Pharisees. The Pharaoh hardened his heart, even though he saw the power of God through the ten plagues. It was not until the last plague, the plague of the, the death of the unborn, of the firstborn child, and all of the firstborn animals, that he eventually decided to let the Israelites go, but he still eventually changed his mind and pursued the Israelites. Pharaoh's hardened heart can represent people who hear God's word but reject it. They see God's power revealed in so many ways, yet they reject the pleading of the Holy Spirit. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they saw all things that Jesus did. They, too, hardened their hearts. They saw everything about Jesus that pointed to him as the Messiah. They saw the miracles, the life he lived, the lessons he taught, yet they, too, hardened their hearts to the point of violating every precept and rule and law of Passover so they could condemn Jesus. Pharisees can represent individuals who have a form of godliness but deny its power. They are people who seem Christ-like or who seem godlike in appearance, but in their hearts they're unforgiving, full of pride, full of jealousy, envious. Don't be like Pharaoh. Don't be like the Pharisees. Do not harden your heart. We are not saved by denomination. We are saved through Christ. And Christ would like for us to have a relationship with him. So as I conclude, and in conclusion, the place where Christ won laid represents power, hope, salvation. Come see the place where the Lord lay. He is not here, for he is risen. This Easter, as many celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, let us open our hearts and accept him into our lives. And if we have already, and if we already have a relationship with him, let us take this opportunity to commit our lives to him. And if you have not done so, why not do so at this time? It is my prayer my brothers and sisters, that the hope of the blessed resurrection, as we contemplate on Jesus' resurrection, let us also contemplate on the assurance of his soon return. May God bless each and every one of you on this joyous day. Sitting or kneeling, would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, This is the day you have made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our hearts are full today because the tomb was empty. Our lives are blessed because Christ was accursed. Our sins wiped away because he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We find ourselves in a time that feels uncertain, frightening, disorienting. But you do not change like the shifting shadows. You number every hair upon our heads. You know the end from the beginning. You are the great physician and have risen with healing in your wings. And so we come praying that you would stay this virus, 
Bring healing to those who are suffering and comfort to those who grieve. May the hope of the resurrection bring solace. Father, we cast all our anxiety upon you for you care, and you rule and reign from on high. If any day shows this, it is Easter. For today the grip of fear is cast out by your perfect love, the sting of the grave is vanquished, the serpent's head crushed, the grave's throat stopped, sorrows healed, tears dried, and we are ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven by the risen and exalted Christ. And so made like him, like him we rise, ours the cross, the grave, the skies. We now pause to pray for the Naval Academy. Give your grace to all those who lead and guide her affairs, that they may discharge their respective duties acceptably unto you. To our scattered midshipmen, give wisdom and strength, that they may diligently and honorably pursue their studies, confront with courage the challenges of life, and perform their duties faithfully unto you. Give rest to those who feel overwhelmed, who are weary and heavy laden, for your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And mercifully take into your almighty and most gracious protection the Navy, Marine Corps, and sister services. Preserve those who serve from danger upon the sea, on the land, and in the air, and from the violence of the enemy until that day when swords are beaten into plowshares and wars, famine, and disease are no more. And now let us pray the words our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now would you join me in the Midshipman's Prayer. Almighty Father, whose way is in the sea, whose paths are in the great waters, whose command is over all and whose love never faileth, let me be aware of thy presence and obedient to thy will. Keep me true to my best self, guarding me against dishonesty in purpose and in deed, and helping me so to live that I can stand unashamed and unafraid, before my shipmates, my loved ones, and thee. Protect those in whose love I live. Give me the will to do my best and to accept my share of responsibilities with a strong heart and a cheerful mind. Make me considerate of those entrusted to my leadership and faithful to the duties my country has entrusted in me. Let my uniform remind me daily of the traditions of the service of which I am a part. If I am inclined to doubt, steady my faith. If I am tempted, make me strong to resist. If I should miss the mark, give me courage to try again. Guide me with the light of truth and keep before me the life of him by whose example and help I trust to obtain the answer to my prayer, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now join in us in singing the Navy hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, followed by our closing hymn, number 358 in the gray hymnal, Because He Lives. Yeah. 
Receive now the Lord's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.